Can you introduce yourself and, and how you got involved with this? Okay. My name is Jerry Harper and I've, I've known John and Lisa for about uh, 16, 17 years. And before I retired from work, I used to come in and have coffee and some of their homemade pastries and sandwiches and soups. Then after I retired, what well, John asked me about, you know, helping him out uh, in case he was sick or was in an accident, to have somebody to back him up. So I started out to be a part-time roaster. Uh, that was uh, five years ago, going on into my sixth year now. And now I'm, John is my backup. <laughs> I do most of the roasting. And if I've got to be out or something, well, John will go so he can keep up with his trade, okay? But uh, John taught me how to roast, and then going on the internet and reading uh, different articles about how to improve, uh, you know, what do you do to make a bean better? What do you do to make a bean worse, you know? How do you develop the flavors and all? And like I say, the internet has a lot of good information. And then you get into it and then you do a little bit of experimentation yourself to see you know, how to enhance the flavor. Or sometime maybe when you let a batch get away from you, well, then you see what it does to over roast or, or something like that. But, like I say, it's a way to get me out of the house. I'm retired, and so it gets me out of the house, and uh, then it's just a wonderful place here to work and meet all the people every day. And so it's my social event for the day. <laughs> I've never seen raw coffee beans before. Yeah, this is Tanzanian pea berry. And see, uh, that's actually an inferior bean. A cherry is supposed to have two of these. These just have one and they're small. And then this is a, I guess a typical, and that's uh, Sadamo. But you can see the difference in them. Mm -hmm. 
And you mix those? Well, we roast everything individually. Then we do make blends, but we blend them after we roast them. a little bit different. See the color of that one's different. Mm -hmm.
tiring part of the job. Well, I actually get going while if I'm going to flavor uh, beans or something, I'll do other things during that, or if I'm going to mix them together to make blends, mm -hmm. I'll mix them while I'm letting this roast. But you got to make sure, and that's one good thing about the buzzer, if I'm off uh, somewhere else, then the buzzer tells me that, hey, it's time to get back. So within just a few minutes after that goes off, then it's going to be at the point of where I want it to roast. Now how do you, how, are you just doing by time or do you do by color? Or? Well, I do by time and color. Like I say, that's the reason I just the gas and the uh, cutoff temperature for the gas so that I stop adding heat because once I get through the what we call the first pop and the first pop is like in popcorn the beans get hot enough that the moisture in them start uh, creating steam and that makes it pop and the bean actually grows you'll see that when they come out you see how small they are now and then when uh, uh, it goes through that first pop where you'll hear it uh, the bean actually expands and then uh, that's all an uh, endothermic reaction you're actually adding heat to it to cause that to happen once that starts happening and you go into the second pop then you got an exothermic or it's giving off heat because of the oils coming out and burning hmm. and and then that's when we start getting a dark, rich color, you know. And the flavor, you get past the raw bean taste. This will go to what we call a cinnamon color. Um, kind of a brownish color. And you'll see the beans get into that color. And then when we really start getting into the last part of the roast, then we are actually charring or uh, burning the sugars and all to make it come up dark color. Then. And as you uh, roast, you reduce the sweetness and you also uh, reduce the acidity uh, of the beans. And each bean has a different acidity and amount of sugar. Uh, there's so many different chemical compounds in a bean and you're changing all those as you apply heat to them. See, I can't sample it here. Let's see what the beans. You use that to take two or three dips out because the ones right up against the front end this don't get roasted quite as well sometimes. But you see that bean turning that cinnamon color. this which is down in the beans and tell me what temperature is down in the beans and then this one is reading the air temperature coming across the top of the beans. Now what beans uh, this is coming from uh, Ethiopia, and this is coming from this one is Indonesia and Sumatra. So this is out on the western end of Indonesia, and this is what in the southern mid-southern part of Africa, 
and the one we've got in there is actually where coffee started, is in Ethiopia. It's where the early, uh, well, where they started with coffee. And it spread from there. See, Ethiopia right there in the, where I guess you call it, what, central part of Africa. And then you see it's Tanzania is right down below it there. Here's where coffee came from, spread up into Europe, over to India, and then it finally came over to Central and South America, and then to other islands and all around. Second most traded commodity other than oil. <laughs> the history of coffee is that uh, in the early years it was found in uh, Ethiopia and some goat herders actually saw their goats acting funny and they saw that they were eating this particular plant and which later on became uh, coffee. Um, exactly how they learned how to roast it I think it actually had a fire or some and some of these were burned and that's how they found out about roasting coffee. Uh, originally coffee was basically declared, declared for medicinal purposes only and uh, also for the rich and people that could control it and everything. Um, then it uh, moved from there into Europe but the climate was too cold so they had to raise it in hot houses and that became a problem when you need millions of trees because a tree will only uh, produce about a pound to a pound and a half of coffee per year. So when you think of the tons of coffee that are consumed, how many millions and probably billions of trees that are out there. So we're in what the Tropic of uh, Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn around the equator is where most of the coffee is grown because I think it's something like 57 degrees that uh, you got to keep the temperature above so that the plants will survive. Um, there are two types, the Arabica and uh, Robusta or Robusta. Uh, the Arabica is the more desirable because of the flavor and all it has. Uh, the Robusta does have a higher uh, caffeine content, so it is used in a lot of espresso drinks because of the higher caffeine level. Um, the thing about it is the trees, most of the foliage is kept off of them, so that as much of the nutrients and all will go to raising the cherries themselves. And you have a cherry because it turns red, and when it's red that means it's time to pick. And in that cherry you normally find two seeds or the coffee beans. Uh, first step after you pick it, then you gotta deep pulp it, take the outer skin and the pulp off and uh, get that off of the bean. Then you wash the beans and then they put them normally out on concrete pads to be uh, dried and they'll take and turn them from time to time so that the beans dry. There are two types of ways of uh, cleaning beans in the more arid areas or dry areas where there's a shortage of water, you have the dry process where they have water available and they actually use water to wash the beans to help uh, get the pulp and everything off of it. Uh, drying, some of it now in modern days is done mechanically, but most of it still is done out on concrete pads and where it's turned until it dries. Then it's sold to a broker or to some corporation 
to be distributed around the world. And we buy the beans through a broker and we buy probably about 16 different regulars and got about a half a dozen of decaf. And um, most of the decaffeinization is done in Germany or Canada. And all of that caffeine then is sold to put in Coke products and other types of things like that. Uh, then in our process, after we buy the beans, we roast each individual bean separately because each one of them has a little bit different roasting characteristics. And we do that through with what we have now is a 30 pound Ambex uh, roaster. It is a natural gas fired or heated underneath the drum. Rotates and coils air across the beans and we will adjust a little bit of the amount of gas we have. Also the time based on whether we want a light city roast, city roast, full city roast, a French roast or an Italian roast. And all of these are basically uh, just charring or caramelizing the uh, sugars that are in. And, um, once we get it to the level we want it, then we take it out, put it into the cooling area of the roaster, we, and then we start drawing air across the beans to cool it so that the beans will not keep on roasting. If you don't cool them, uh, they'll sit there in the temperature they have, and the fact that they're actually in an exothermic reaction, they will continue to roast and go too far for it. And like I say, after we get to the point, then we cool it and get the beans to uh, cool. And then from that point on, we'll either sell them as individual beans or we'll sell them as a blend of uh, one or two or three or four or whatever you want to put in. And when you start uh, blending beans, uh, each bean has its own particular taste or palate and when you blend beans then you start getting a wider palate or um, a wider range of flavors within that uh, blend. Uh, then on like espresso we want to develop one that will have a, what we call crema which is the foamy part that comes out of the espresso machine when you're uh, pulling a shot for an espresso type of drink. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. See, this iron temperature is coming up and then the bean temperature is coming up. Keeping them rotating and tumbling, pulling air from <coughs> that makes it the bean, all the beans roast more uniformly. You yeah, see, they're really starting to get dark in there. Right. And you hear the gas turn off, you hear the chain. Uh -huh. That was the gas turning on. So, I mean, it's got so a temperature. I can set the temperature at different levels and I'll show you on this one right here we're actually going to take it on up to a higher temperature and I let that take it on up so that I can get it up to the level. Now the temperature keeps on increasing like say now because the stuff is the beans are roasting giving off the gases and the oil um, turning into an exothermic reaction. So it's given all heat. Now this is perforated. Got another fan pulled air through it. This rotates and stirs it and it cools.
temperature that I'm going to dump it out. But I've also watched it here, and it has the right color. So that, that's uh, real, that's what we call city here. about 15% of the beans either in chaff or in um, moisture. But like I say now, I'm going to lose about what? 20, well, 15, 3 pounds, so I only end up with about 17 pounds of roasted coffee. The higher you take the roast, the more you're going to lose.
tell the machine is not clean is that the beans will start being unevenly roasted. Oh, right. So that's the reason I have to clean it first thing every day. Well, if I'm going for a real long period of time, if I'm roasting on over for this afternoon, I probably would want to stop and clean it to make sure that I'm getting a good air flow. So when you're cleaning it, what, what are you, what are you doing? What are you cleaning? Well, all of this chaff and stuff that you're seeing, like this, that's coming off of the bean. That's the skin coming off of the bean itself. Mm -hmm. The bean has a skin on it, and that's what that is, and that comes loose, and then it either is picked up in the airflow from the drum and it's collected down here or while it's here cooling it goes through the perforation and falls underneath it. The thing about it, all the beans uh, have different flavors or different things that you can taste within them and this is due to the growing season whether it's dry or wet or extremely hot or cooler also due to the minerals and all that are in the soil uh, i guess the example i use is like a valdelia onion i buy a valdelia onion set and i grow it here in carter county and it tastes one way but if i get it down in valdelia georgia because of the difference of the minerals that onion is going to taste totally different than one I would grow here even though it's the same uh, onion set. So the same way even though the uh, same uh, replica type plant is being used because of the different growing seasons, the different minerals in the soil, then each coffee has a different flavor or palette and you'll hear them say that it's got a, a chocolate flavor or it may have a nutty taste and again this is due to the minerals that are in the soil that is absorbed into that particular bean so that's the reason we have different ones now organic is basically trying to be eco-friendly and then also being fair trade, fair trade is where we're trying to buy coffees that is giving more of the money back to the grower rather than the wholesaler or retailer is that you're trying to help out the grower uh, to get more of the profit from growing the crop. Because normally you'll have a big corporation comes in and buys the beans and then they will distribute them around the world. The beauty we have here at this coffee shop is the fact that we have the raw beans and we have something like 15, 16 different varieties, but we also do our own roasting. And through that, then we can customize the roast to whatever our clientele wants or to develop what we feel like are good tasting coffees so we can do that individually. Fine tuning. Mm -hmm. Fine -tuning. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, the business end of who you provide coffee to? And Locally we have developed with, say within a 50 mile radius and so local coffee houses uh, and we supply coffee to them but like say through some of the students that come to East Tennessee State, Milligan College, and they have worked here, then they know about us and they will order coffee and we ship coffee to different places all over the United States. They know about our coffee and know how we try to keep it turning over, keep it fresh, because that's the other thing too in in coffee that once you get coffee that's roasted today in fact you need to let it sit for probably 24 hours 
or so before you actually will brew it to allow it to stabilize. But then after that, then you want to probably uh, brew it within two weeks to get the maximum freshness and the flavor out of it that you can. And that's the difference in our coffee and most other coffees is time it's roasted, goes through distribution on a shelf at a grocery store and you buying it and getting it to your house, well then it's aged for you know, a pretty good while. And here, like I so said, we're roasting two days a week or we can roast more often if we have to to make sure that we keep the coffee turning over that we have on our shelves and we're sending it out to our customers and they're getting it within within the week after we uh, roast it. Excellent, thank you. Any last words of wisdom for uh, anything you can think of we didn't hit on? Well, it's been good to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.